Welcome to the campus of North Carolina A&T State University. I'm Stan Verrett. This is the nation's largest historically black university. It's a campus steeped in history. In 1960, four A&T students staged a sit-in at a previously segregated lunch counter in downtown Greensboro. The Greensboro Four are memorialized here on campus for lighting a spark of student activism that spread nationwide. So that makes A&T a great setting for our conversation on sports, race, and achievement. President Obama is going to join us to discuss a wide range of topics, including what it means to be undefeated. Why is the meaning of this word important? And what meaning does it hold in our lives? The first line presents us with the situation, having been beaten. The second line, however, overcome by adversity, is a decision that we must make for ourselves. I still got the world! I still got the world! As the great poet Maya Angelou once said, you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeat. Against all odds, I don't know why we want to take the hardest road. So you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. So we can see, oh, that happened, and I rose. Welcome to ESPN and the Undefeated's Conversation with the President. I'm Stan Verrett. We're joined tonight by dozens of students from here at North Carolina A&T State University and other invited guests will be a part of our conversation. We're going to talk about race, sports, and achievement. We'll identify challenges in those areas. We'll celebrate progress in those areas and hopefully find solutions to some of the issues that are affecting our country at this time. And joining us to do that the 44th President of the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Hello, everybody. Hey. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, everybody have a seat. Thought the standing ovation would take up the whole hour? You know what? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, they, were, they were clapping for you, Stan. <laughs> it's great to see you. Thank you so much for uh, hosting us here today. Thank you for being here. Uh, we hope to make this a, a very productive hour. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk to you about what it means to be undefeated, although I have a sense that we already know in part what it means to you. Take a listen. I have no more campaigns to run. My only agenda, <laughs> I know because I won both of them. Um, so you're very much undefeated in that sense. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but seriously, Mr. President, when you, when you hear Maya Angelou's words, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. How do those words resonate with you? Well, you may know a couple weeks back we opened the Smithsonian's National Museum on African American History and Culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I recommend all of you visiting at some point, but to walk through that museum, uh, starting on the bottom floor, uh, where you see the Middle Passage and uh, the artifacts of, of slavery uh, up through Jim Crow, uh, and then to end on that top floor where you're seeing Beyonce and <laughs> Michael Jordan and uh, you know, Oprah and amazing business people. Uh, what it does is it chronicles, I think, an undefeated spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, we all get knocked down 
in life. And uh, that's true regardless of race, faith, gender. Uh, and as Maya points out, the, the question is, how do you respond? Mm -hmm. um, do you get back up once you get knocked down? And I think the, the history of America is people who oftentimes came here with nothing. That's obviously most true for uh, African Americans, but it's true for the entire immigrant experience right. for the most part. And yet we're able in some fashion uh, to make a way out of no way. And, and through faith and dedication and perseverance to learn from defeats and thereby render them temporary. Mm -hmm. To figure out uh, the strength inside that allows you to uh, achieve your goals. And there's not a student here at uh, North Carolina A&T who has not uh, had family members who have overcome obstacles that for many of us are unimaginable. This institution uh, is a testament to perseverance and not being defeated. And I want to thank the Aggies for hosting us uh, here today. And historically, black colleges and universities are an example of finding mechanisms to, uh, even in the most difficult circumstances, uh, uh, carve out a better life uh, for future generations. What about for you personally? Uh, has, there, has there been a moment during either of your terms where, where you felt defeated but you knew you had to get back up? Well, look, it, there have been times where I've been aggravated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but, but when you're President of the United States, uh, you are occupying an office of such privilege and uh, the, the opportunity to impact so many lives every single day, even when polls are bad, even when folks are talking about you, uh, that uh, really during my presidency, there has, there's never been a time where I felt like, okay, uh, this is too much. Now, on the path to the presidency, uh, there have been multiple times where I felt like, man, this, this is not going well. Um, like when? I lost uh, a race for Congress only eight years before I was elected president and got thumped. One wasn't just beat, but <laughs> got beat really bad. And people were saying, uh, first of all, you should have changed your name because nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> And, uh, you know, you always have to be careful with sports metaphors uh, because everybody... Especially with us. With the SPN. <laughs> you know, so, so you never want to compare yourself to, to the amazing athletes uh, that uh, we see on, on, on Sports Center all the time. What is true about politics that's similar to sports, though, is when you lose, you lose publicly. Right. I, everybody knows, <laughs> and everybody's talking about you, and uh, it's a hard feeling uh, because you feel like I thought I had something to offer, and turns out, um, turns out I didn't. And yet, what uh, I understood, maybe not the day after, but uh, in in the months that followed, was that had I not gone through that experience then I couldn't have been successful running for the U.S. Senate. Right. Um, and what I also came to understand uh, was a lot of times when you're young and you're trying to make your mark on the world, you think it's about you. And one of the benefits of defeat is to, to take some of the vanity out of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And you start reminding yourself, part of your strength comes from realizing 
oh, this isn't about me. This is about what I'm doing for somebody else. And it may be that uh, God has chosen another way for me to serve, but I can still serve. And, and when you start having that attitude, when you have an attitude that, that this is about something bigger than me, then your individual victories or defeats become less, uh, less important than the broader project. Uh, and I think that when we look at every successful movement and every successful leader, they, there, there's a point at which they start recognizing that this goes beyond me. And, and again, to use the sports analogy, the, the teams are like that too. Right. You know, teams that, are, that, that, that ultimately win typically have had to go through a point in time where uh, their best player started realizing, I can't do this by myself. I, now, you know, I'm from Chicago, so you know, <laughs> when I think about basketball, I'm thinking about Michael Jordan and right. the Bulls. And he he the, did a lot by himself. He yeah, did a lot. He did. Not, not totally, though. But right. Detroit kept on yeah. pounding us right. <laughs> until we finally said, man, we got to get Pippen in there. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and so I, I think you go through that same process, uh, it, whatever uh, uh, your career is. All right, Mr. President, we want to get the students involved here. They, they have questions for you. Khadija Stiegel is our first student with a question. Khadija, what's your question? Hi, Mr. President. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. As we talk about overcoming challenges, I wanted to seek your advice about overcoming challenges while also having a family. While being an, an eager student here at a and I'm still in the process of overcoming the challenge of being a young mother to my daughter, Lola, who is a year old, and also a wife to a PhD student. As a president of the United States, a husband, and a father, what is one trait you believe one must possess in order to overcome challenges while also balancing a family? Well, first of all, uh, I wish you had brought your baby because I love babies. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we could have hung out. <laughs> Second of all, I, I think the trick, uh, and, and this is more directed to your husband, he should just do what you tell him to do. <laughs> <laughs> which has worked very well in my house. Um, but, uh, y y you know, the, the truth is that uh, balancing uh, professional achievement and family is uh, something that Michelle and I have had to wrestle with. Uh, and, and she's talked about it uh, at length. I, I have, too. Uh, I think that uh, it's particularly burdensome on the mom and that's why my message is probably more for your husband than for you which is uh, you have to be there and present and at home my, my favorite uh, uh, soundbite from Michelle about this is I remember right after Malia was born very early on um, a friend of mine called to see if I wanted to play basketball and I said, no man, I can't, I, I, I got to babysit Malia. And so I, I hung up the phone and, and she turned to me and she said, you know what, if it's your own child, it's not babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Now, <laughs> that was a good mindset right. to change. Uh, but I think that's what a lot of uh, men and dads, even ones who love their kids and are involved, I think there's this sense of if I'm just, you know, taking them out for ice cream and uh, hanging out at the park or the zoo, that I'm kind of doing my job as opposed to all the nasty stuff that's involved in raising children. And, uh, and there's no doubt that Michelle carried a greater burden than I did particularly because the nature of my work required a lot of travel. Um, does it? <laughs> it does. So, so, the, uh, so, so, so I would say to the uh, soon-to-be dads here, just uh, understanding the, the level of responsibility and commitment that's required and the things that you have to cut out because uh, a lot of moms are already cutting those things out. Uh, and, and if you're going to have a real partnership, uh, then you have to, you know, you have to give uh, and, and, and not just, uh, not just take. Um, 
And, and, and when I talk to, to friends of mine who are just now becoming fathers, uh, and, and I'm surrounded by people who work really hard, uh, you know, I always tell them, and this is something I'm absolutely certain of, on my deathbed, I will not remember any bills I passed, I will not remember any speech I gave, I will not remember getting the Nobel Prize. What I will remember is holding hands with my daughters, taking them down to a park. I, I'm sh that's one thing I know, is that on my deathbed, that's what I will remember. All right. And you know, if, you, if, you, if you approach life with that attitude, then you're going to appropriately invest in uh, what is most important. All right, Mr. President, we have one of North Carolina A&T's finest, one of its distinguished alums. You probably recognize him from this television guy? and movies. <laughs> Terrence J. is What's with going us. On, man? How are you? Good to see all you, right. Mr. President. He's got a question for you as well. Thank you so much, Stan. Uh, first of all, you're welcome to come back to homecoming. We'd love to have you, and we have a great team. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> we have a great team. I hear you. Come on back. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Mr. President, I have a, a vision board. Uh, Maya Angelou was on that vision board, Muhammad Ali. Oprah has been on it, Beyonce, uh, you and the First Lady have been on that vision board for many, many years. And whenever I'm going through a time in my life where I, I feel defeat or I need inspiration and I have a tough audition coming up or a big meeting with a director and I need to pull from something, I pull from watching you. Who do you look at as a source of inspiration? Who guides you through those difficult days in the Oval Office when you might have had a complicated negotiation with a world leader or a bill that you wanted to see pass? Mm -hmm. Who do you look at and say, you know what, if they're doing it, I can do it as well? Well, it's a great, it's a great question. Look, uh, there, there are some usual suspects, uh, somebody like a Dr. King uh, or an Abraham Lincoln, uh, and I try to project the kind of burdens and weight they were having to carry. Uh, and uh, the challenges I face pale in comparison to what they had to go through. So Nelson Mandela, you, you go visit Robben Island and you're standing in his cell and you're thinking about 27 years. Wow. And the only time you leave is to break a rock in a nearby uh, pit and to be able to then come out after 27 years without bitterness and to be able to lead your country and reconcile what seemed irreconcilable, then you say, okay, well, I can deal with a Republican Congress. <laughs> so so it, it, it puts things in perspective. Um, but I, 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 I will tell you that actually, uh, in addition to those figures, what really inspires me is the people I'm serving, just ordinary folks. I get 10 letters a day. That I, I get 40,000 letters right. a day. Uh, I've made it a habit since I first came into office of getting 10 letters uh, that are put in my pack, my stack of reading, and and they're from ordinary folks, and and I know that uh, they're fairly representative because some of them say we love you and you're doing a great job. Others say, you are an idiot, the worst president ever. Um, but a lot of times people just tell their stories. And you'll read about a single mom who went to school, is doing everything right, trying to raise a kid, and she's got a lot of debt, and she's worrying about paying the bills, and she's in a tough neighborhood, and. Uh, she's worried that her kid uh, is going to be, uh, you know, getting into things that will, will put his life in danger. And the courage and the determination that that mom shows then leads me to say, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I'm going to work hard to make sure that I'm giving her a better shot. Um, and, and, and so uh, I, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. When you feel as if y what you are doing is not about you and your success, but delivering for people who put their hopes and faith in you, then you don't want to disappoint. I, I will tell you, when I ran 
the second time in 2012. Some of you remember I had uh, that first debate, which was round, roundly panned. Everybody said, oh, you were terrible. Um, and you know, what is true is, is that I, I've always kind of hated these debate formats and the uh, and and so it wasn't my best performance but what really got me to dig deep was traveling then afterwards and seeing all these volunteers who were working so hard in my campaign most of them young kids and they're all trying to like keep a you know positive attitude and so, but you could tell they were like feeling bad like oh man you know you know, we're out here working, and maybe we might lose because <laughs> the president messed up. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, oh, these, these kids are pouring their, their hearts and souls into making calls and knocking on doors. I'm not going to disappoint them, right? So, so that's so much, so often where you get the strength. Uh, and I also think, by the way, going back to parenthood, that, that, that's part of where parents get their strength is they look at their child and they say, you know what, I don't have time for, to, to, to feel bad or not perform because I just love that child so much. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, gotta, I, I gotta figure it out. And, and, and that, I think, more than anybody way up here, ends up uh, being the most powerful motivator for me. All right, Mr. President, we, we know you love basketball. I do love some basketball. And so let's get one of the student athletes involved here. Sam Hunt is a junior guard in the North Carolina a Aggie basketball team. He's got a question for you. Pleasure to have you here, Mr. President. Um, many athletes are taking a stand on social issues of today. What do you feel is the most effective way for professional and collegiate athletes to make a change? I think there's so many ways to, to, to have an impact. Um, when I was growing up, I had a lot of athletes that I loved. Uh, I just had a chance to see Dr. J come by the office, who looks really good. Oh, yeah, I've seen it him at golf like tournaments could, in Los Angeles. Looks like fantastic. he could still play. Uh, and I had a big poster of him. He had big afro, and he's coming in. He's dunking. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so, so he was one of my favorites. But I, I will tell you that probably the two athletes that were – most influential in how I thought about what it meant to be a man, uh, who were still alive when I was, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, one was Muhammad Ali, and the other was Arthur Ashe. Now, what's really interesting is, from a personality perspective, they were completely different. Absolutely. Right? Ali was all personality and loud and noisy and uh, truth-telling and self-promoting and uh, brash, right? And just a bigger, bigger than life personality. Mm -hmm. And was perceived by the majority at the time as a troublemaker, black nationalist, somebody who was anti-American, right? By the time you guys were born and grew up, he was this grandfatherly, you know, lovable figure. But at, at the time, he was hugely controversial. Arthur, on the other hand, buttoned down, you right. know, spoke proper English and conjugated his verbs and was, <laughs> you know, looking all, you know, like a, like a uh, professor or something. Um, and was perceived as, you know, because he was in a white sport, was always very gentlemanly and, you know, humble in how he spoke. And yet, both of them were transformational. Right? Ali gave people enormous pride and ultimately caused not just black Americans, but white Americans to question what their government was doing and how they were thinking about racial justice. Arthur, in his own way, was transformational in getting people to recognize the dignity of African Americans despite 
whatever might be thrown at them, mobilized the anti-apartheid movement uh, in a way that uh, if you talk to South Africans, they'll tell you had a real impact in terms of liberating uh, that country and helping to uh, create uh, an entire movement here in the United States. The point being that how you do it is less important than your commitment to use whatever platforms you have to speak to the issues that matter uh, to, to people, uh, to speak to not just issues of racial justice, but to, to speak to issues of uh, you know, discrimination against Muslims or uh, sexual assault on college campuses or uh, you know, a whole host of issues that we confront on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, make us fall short of our ideals. And so, so, so my attitude with respect to, to, to all young people, including athletes who may have a higher profile, is you get engaged, you get involved, you get educated about the issues that are affecting your lives, and then uh, figure out what's the best way for you to make a difference. Some people may decide that's through protest. Others may decide, I want a mentor. And we'll have a chance to talk about my brother's keeper, but you know, the ability of somebody like you to go mentor some uh, eight-year-old or 10-year-old kid who lives right around here, who maybe doesn't have a dad and doesn't have uh, a lot, you paying attention to him and you're a guard and you a star guard on your team and you're taking him to a ball game and asking him what he's doing in school, that is revolutionary. So, um, so, so my advice is, is not that there's one way of bringing about change. I think there are multiple ways of bringing about change. And, and, and one of the things that I think uh, I'm always telling young people to guard against is, you know, uh, not to criticize others for how they're going about their stuff. Focus on you and what can you do positively. Uh, and if, if, you, um, if you are committed, engaged, and have studied the issues, um, then you'll have a positive impact and you'll find what feels right for you. The president's certainly been making a positive impact with his My Brother's Keeper initiative. We're going to talk some more about that and get his hopes and wishes for where he'd like to see that program go when our conversation with the president on race, sports, and achievement continues here on ESPN. All right. If it saw me as a resource and not an ailment, let that marinate for a second. What if someone or something continued the efforts to reverse counterproductive and grossly incorrect stereotypes? That people who look like me are criminals from birth. That we only live in broken homes. That we're guilty until proven innocent. What if we really understood the pain behind those numbers? that the reality of life in America makes it easier for me to see a correctional facility than a college classroom, and that this country's current investment is all backwards, that incarcerating a single juvenile in America is $100,000, roughly three times the cost of the average tuition. We are capable of painting our own chapters in history because that is what is expected of us and what we should expect of ourselves. The journey won't always be easy, Anything truly worth accomplishing rarely is, but it is one we must take together. It's what generations before us have done and what those after us need for their tomorrows to be brighter than our today's. We're all each other's strength. We're all my brother's keeper. Back with President Obama, my brother's keeper, an initiative you started a couple of years ago. I read the progress report. Uh, things are going well. Why was this so important to you? Well, when I first came into office, 
the economy was collapsing and we were in the middle of two wars, so we had a lot of stuff going on. Um, and the single most important thing I could do for all people, including uh, communities of color, is to stabilize the economy, start bringing the unemployment rate down, uh, make sure that as many people as possible could stay in their homes, save their pensions, and so we did that. And we, we were uh, you know, successful enough that now we can look back and say after six years we cut the unemployment rate in half and uh, have uh, reduced poverty last year by the largest amount since uh, 1968. Uh, incomes have gone up uh, faster than uh, any time that they've been recording uh, how fast incomes go up. Uh, so we've made real progress, 20 million people with health insurance. But when I first came into office, my goal was not just to get back to where we were. The goal was how do we really get to those communities that were in most need of help. And in the wake of the Trayvon Martin verdict, uh, when so often uh, the conversation on TV gets polarized mm -hmm. and, and people go to the respective corners. Uh, I thought about what is it that we could do that was affirmative and that would send a clear message to particularly young boys of color who by every measure have more problems um, but who I know from personal experience have amazing uh, potential and opportunities. What is it that we could do to really help? And so we set up My Brother's Keeper. Uh, and it's a combination of things. What I basically did was mobilize the entire federal government, every agency, and said, what is it that you're doing that may either contribute to the problem or solve the problem? And uh, just to take one example, the Department of Education, what we kept on seeing were statistics that uh, young boys of color were more likely to be suspended and expelled for the same behavior even as early as kindergarten. Right? I, the, the, the assumptions and biases were, were deep enough institutionally that uh, it was creating a, a, a path where young African American boys or Latino boys were being tracked in ways that uh, didn't guarantee success, but guaranteed problems. So, so what we started doing in the Department of Education is, let's provide guidance to every school district in the country so that they can be intentional. Start keeping track and, and understanding what it is that you may be doing, not always intentionally, that will lead you to overreact to the behavior of, of a, a black boy in your school versus uh, a, a white boy in your school. And if, if you are thinking about it, then you can start training your teachers differently and potentially solve those problems. So that was inside of government. What we also did, though, was we set up outside of government partnerships with, right now, we've got 250 communities and cities across the country that are doing amazing things. Uh, you know, the mayor of Boston uh, mobilized uh, billions of dollars or millions of dollars with uh, local philanthropies and they've got a whole host of uh, intervention programs, after school programs, mentoring programs, apprenticeship programs, uh, working with faith communities, working with local businesses, uh, working the police as well as uh, community leaders. and. We're seeing all kinds of positive outcomes. And we're now trying to get uh, more and more businesses to participate and prominent organizations. So I just had a chance to meet with some incredible young men mm -hmm. who are part of the My Brother's Keeper network. Uh, a couple of them uh, are mentoring through the program. So uh, Edward here. Uh, uh, is doing amazing mentoring. He, he's a, he's a He's an Aggie, okay. and as we speak, he's out, out there uh, providing STEM education 
mentoring, uh, science, math, technology, helping young kids, sixth graders, eighth graders, do build robots and send rockets up into the sky and coding so that they understand this is a path for them. A number of the young men that I met with, they themselves went through the program. A couple of them have been in juvie and uh, through uh, this program are now graduating from college, uh, aspiring to be teachers themselves. Uh, we've been working with the NBA uh, and other organizations to promote mentoring programs. Uh, so uh, there's a website, men, uh, mentor Dot gov that you, got, that, got gov, that you yep. can go to in order to find out how you can be a mentor. Um, major corporations, including Sprint, and uh, Marcello uh, Quale from uh, Sprint is here today. Uh, they have committed to uh, making sure that one million young people in underserved communities who don't have internet at home are going to have digital uh, access and broadband and, and uh, uh, you know, the ability to plug in to help to erase the, the digital divide. To, to start closing that digital gap. So, so there's, there's a whole host of activities uh, that are going on, but the, but the central principle, and this was really driven home in my conversations with these amazing young men, is for so many of our boys, um, because half of them don't have dads in the house, and moms are doing heroic work, but they're working and trying to keep up with everything. <clears throat> to have some adult who's taken interest in them, what? to have somebody who's showing them, here's an alternative, here's a pathway, here's an opportunity that you can seize, and you are worth something, and you are important, and you're a leader, uh, it doesn't take a lot to transform the lives of young men and, 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 and one of the things that uh, uh, one of the uh, participants in this roundtable we just had told me which is, I think is, is especially important is is understanding the power of, of second chances and redemption um, because what I described to them some of them were talking about yeah I was on the streets and I was doing drugs and I was I was like yeah I was doing the same thing <laughs> it's just that I was in Hawaii right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going to get shot Right. Uh, and there was, there was only so far I could fall if I made bad decisions. I made all kinds of bad decisions. And so if that's true for me, that's true for kids everywhere. And the question is, are we creating enough of a, of a network that kids aren't falling through the cracks and when they make a mistake, we hold them accountable, uh, we, we explain to them uh, the, the mistakes they made, more importantly, that they start internalizing how they can uh, control their own destiny. Uh, but we also say, you know, you are fundamentally good and uh, we're, we're ready to, to, to work with you. So I'm, I'm really proud of the work that's been doing. So if you're making bad decisions, you can reverse feel one day maybe you can be president. <laughs> if you want. Now, you may want to talk to Michelle to see if, whether that's the career path that uh, you should pursue. We have uh, one of the mentees from My Brother's Keeper who's here with us, Devin Edwards. He has a question for you. How you doing, Mr. President? Hey, Devin. Devin's one of the young men I, I was just talking to. All right. My question for you is, um, growing up in Boston, it was easy to get, you know, caught up in the streets. Me and my friends had nothing to turn to, really. Um, we, we didn't believe in the government. We didn't believe that um, there was second chances. Mm -hmm. We didn't believe that there was better opportunities out there for us. In any given case, MBK changed my life for the better. It provided me with that opportunity. What do you see MBK continuing to provide for brothers like myself who come through violent neighborhoods and, and troubling upbringings? Well, uh, De Devin, your, your testimony uh, is is powerful. Devin told the story of how he was on the streets chasing you know, dollars and uh, not always doing things uh, on the straight and narrow. Uh, now he's working for the Department of Human Services in Boston and interacting with the community and 
helping others uh, who are coming up behind him. He's only 22 years old, so you know who knows what he could be doing in the future. Um, you know what we want to do is to just continue to expand and deepen the efforts that we've already started because it's only been going on for two years now and we've already got uh, 250 communities as I said who have a My Brother's Keeper program but some cities are doing better than others some uh, you know, corporate citizens are investing more than others and we want everybody to get involved and, 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 and part of the reason is not just because this country should live up to its ideal that every child matters and if you work hard you should be able to uh, achieve your piece of the American dream uh, but it's also going to be an economic necessity look uh, uh, young people of color are going to be the workers of the future if we were able to close the achievement gap employment gap wealth gap uh, that currently exists in this country, the whole economy would probably go to, grow 2 percent faster. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but actually it would mean trillions of dollars of additional wealth for everybody. Mm -hmm. Those young workers are the ones who are going to be paying for us old heads on Social Security. <laughs> uh, they are the ones who are going to be the business customers of the future. So if they got money in their pocket, then businesses do better. They're the ones who are going to be paying taxes, which means that our ability to rebuild our roads and our schools and pay for our military and our veterans, it's all dependent on them. So if they're unemployed or underemployed, if they're in prison, uh, that is bad for all of us, not just for them. So this is not a people of color challenge. This, this is, is an American. This challenge. is an American challenge, and uh, and, and and so uh, my hope is that more and more people get involved. Uh, and as I said, it's amazing how just a little bit of effort can make a big difference. And, and I'll give you one example in terms of our, our mentoring program. Uh, Steph Curry and I did a, a little video promoting mentoring. And, you know, it, it had me showing him how to shoot a basketball. Because he needs to learn. He needed, <laughs> he needed a few tips. Um, <laughs> and in, in, in the days after that ran, the number of people who went to mentor.gov popped up 4,000%. Wow. And we've been able to meet what was a modest goal in terms of how many mentors we could generate in the first three years or four years we did in one year because it turned out that there were a lot of people who really did want to participate and get involved they just need to find out or be reminded that there was a, a way for them to sign up so that's what we want to do and this is something I will continue to be involved with after uh, uh, I'm done being president. I, I should point out, by the way, Michelle, uh, just so the ladies here don't feel left out, uh, Michelle has been focusing on uh, m uh, mentoring programs for young girls. We've got a White House office of women and girls that has been constantly making sure that uh, the, the interests and concerns of, of girls and young women uh, are promoted and now she's initiated something called let girls learn mm -hmm. that is not just domestic but global because we still have uh, uh, too many communities and too many nations where uh, young women are not given the same opportunities as boys are uh, but the point is for us to invest in young people as you said Stan that th th this is not uh, something that should just concern African-Americans or uh, any particular community uh, this is something that should concern all of us because th this is how the nation will thrive in the same way that uh, when you started getting black ball players in baseball baseball became better when you started getting 
black players in basketball. Basketball became a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what, what, you know, we just went through an Olympics where we got more medals than ever and we were amazed. Well, you know what? Uh, more than half of the gold medals and medals generally that we won were from our outstanding women athletes. And the reason that happened was because we invested in Title IX many years ago, and so we're way ahead of other countries in terms of giving young women the same athletic opportunities as young men. And so that's a good analogy for, uh, for the country as a whole and, and for our economy as a whole. It's like when you, when you get everybody on the team, when you're drawing from everybody's talents, right. then you're going to feel a stronger team and everybody's going to be a lot better. The gymnastics team, great example of that. Absolutely. You've got a, a, a young Latino woman, you've got Simone, you got, uh, and they are cute as can be. They came by the White House. <laughs> Itty bitty little things. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they're doing stuff. I, I still don't know how they do that stuff. <laughs> Amazing athletes. Absolutely. Tiny. But, and funny too. They, they're just chattering away. Well, we're here at North Carolina a and uh, Historically, black colleges and universities uh, play a big role in solving some of these issues. We're going to delve into that role with President Obama coming up when our conversation with the president on sports, race, and achievement continues. Welcome back to North Carolina a and This area of the campus is hallowed ground. The university's reflection pool is surrounded by four pillars each of them made from brick walls pockmarked with bullet holes. In 1969, under orders from North Carolina's governor, the National Guard opened fire on a protest that spilled onto the university's campus. The pillars are sobering reminders of how far we've come and how far we still have to go in the fight for social justice. HBCUs have been at the forefront of that fight, one of their many contributions to black history and culture. It is not a simple testament to our past. It was not forged by fire or wallpapered in silence. It is built with power, influence, and confidence. This is the harbor and the labor. These walls were built so those could not be denied. Stars like HBCU alum Earl Lloyd, another West Virginia State alum, who became the first black player in the NBA. Like Lou Brock, who left Southern University to transform speed into a lethal weapon in Major League Baseball. And Art Shell, a University of Maryland Eastern Shore alum who made history as the first black head coach in the modern NFL. We tend to associate HBCUs with their stellar marching bands and unmatched homecoming experiences but they're much more. They have produced half of this country's black engineers and have helped shape the careers of 70% of America's black doctors and dentists. How do we ensure HBCUs survive and thrive well into the future? Well, they're doing more than just surviving here. They're thriving at North Carolina A&T. This school of 11,000 students produces more black engineers than any other school in the country. And I think the Aggies are uh, deserving of some recognition for that. Well, while we're here. That. That yeah, we need more engineers than lawyers. <laughs> I can make that joke because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dennis Thomas is also with us tonight. For 15 years, he's been the commissioner of the Mideastern Athletic Conference, which is one of the conferences that house the nation's historically black uh, universities and colleges. Uh, Dr. Thomas had a quote in a piece for the undefeated that he wrote that said, there's no sugarcoating the state of HBCUs. Our institutions are hurting. Nationwide, state funding continues to decline, and our athletic programs are under tremendous financial strain to balance their budgets. So let's continue our conversation now with a question from Ron Stodgill. Ron is an award-winning author and journalist. Mr. President, thank you. 
as you know, uh, historically black colleges and universities right now are, are under siege. They are facing a perfect storm. Um, some of that perfect storm derives from changes within the Department of Education and how it funds student loans and changes in criteria. One program in particular, the Parent Plus program. As you prepare to leave office, how do you respond to critics who think that your administration could have been more supportive, more committed to HBCUs? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, we have increased funding for HBCUs. We're given $4 billion a year to HBCUs. Uh, it is my belief that having uh, incredible institutions like North Carolina A&T uh, producing engineers, doctors, dentists uh, is a foundation stone for uh, building the kind of black middle class wealth and ultimate success that will be important to the entire nation. It's the same reason why we've increased Pell Grants to HBCUs by 150 percent since I came into office. So we actually have made enormous investments in HBCUs. The challenge with the Plus, uh, Parent PLUS program was this was actually a type of loan that was particularly expensive for students and Although it allowed more students to enroll, it was also leaving more students deeply in debt without graduating because of the structure of the loans. And so the notion was to try to improve the way in which young people were financing their educations. Um, and it, because part of our challenge here is to make sure not just that you enroll in college, but that you graduate from college. And you know, HBCUs are uh, diverse. You've got a lot of different schools. And there are institutions where their graduation rates are really high. There are institutions where the graduation rates were and continue to be poor, but the students are still amassing huge amounts of debt. And so what we wanted to do was to just make sure that students and parents were making the best choices possible and looking at the menu of options so that they're lowering their costs as much as possible and getting the maximum value because for a lot of students it's a stretch to go to college. Uh, you know, Malia and Sasha, they don't have to worry that much because Michelle and I have the resources to, for them to go to any kind of school. But if you are uh, the child of a single parent who is working uh, really hard but still just ma barely making the bills and they're s now signing up for a loan and they're taking on that debt, then that's a, that's a burden not just on the child but also on the parents. So, so that's what we've been trying to really focus on now. You are absolutely right that HBCUs generally are suffering more from a general phenomenon in America, and that is the affordability and accessibility of higher education. You know, the truth is that the biggest contributor to problems in higher education and the reason that tuitions have gotten higher, debt loads have gotten higher, is because states have significantly cut their support for higher education. And if you look at state after state, some states are worse than others, but North Carolina here in this state is a, is a prime example. When you have state legislatures that are just lopping off state support for higher education, funding prisons but not funding schools, then the administrators basically have just a handful of choices. Either they drastically reduce course offerings and the quality of uh, scholarship that's taking place in our schools, or they have to charge higher tuition. That then means that students have to take on more debt. 
So part of the goal for HBCUs is the same message that I send on every college campus around the country. Because young people, this is not restricted to HBCUs, although it's worse here, you know, when, when America gets a cold sometimes, black folks get pneumonia. It, it's, it's, it's worse here, but it's a more prevalent problem, and that is that uh, unless state legislatures pick up some of this slack, there's only so much that the federal government's going to be able to fill the void through loans, because ultimately loans mean debt, and it adds up. And, and people can get into trouble. So we actually want to try to figure out how do we lower costs generally. Uh, now, I, th this is not a political event, but uh, I, I do want to just make this very simple point, and I say this every college campus. If you're really concerned about more resources in HBCUs, then you better vote. If you don't vote, then you will not have any say in the decisions that are made in state capitals or in Congress about the kind of support that you receive. It, it, it's as, as simple as that. It, it, it's very, you don't have to be an engineering major to figure out the math on this one. <laughs> uh, and and the, 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 you know, that young ball player asked me earlier uh, the kind of leadership that uh, a student athlete can show. Uh, I would say for student athletes, but for all students, there is an election coming up out there. You should be making sure that everybody is registered and everybody is voting. And you should inform yourself as to whether the candidates, regardless of party, are committed to uh, providing increased support for higher education. If they do, then uh, HBCUs will continue to uh, serve the vital role that they serve uh, for the country as a whole. I'm a Howard alum. I understand the the need for HBCUs and, and what they can provide uh, in our society. All right, uh, in, in a few months, the president is going to have some time on his hands. Uh, he's got some ambitious plans for what he's going to do once he leaves the White House. We're going to talk about those plans when our conversation with the president on race, sports, and achievement continues. down and getting back up. That is our story. And it shapes who we are. Resilient and proud. Undefeated, even in the face of defeat. Our determination was forged amid violence and hostility, and it has changed a still imperfect nation. It is Thurgood Marshall risking his life in southern courthouses to represent men unfairly condemned to death row and later continuing his work from the majesty of the Supreme Court. It is Hank Aaron rising from segregated Mobile, Alabama, and then enduring taunts and threats in his march to Major League Baseball immortality. It is Louisiana's tiny Xavier University, producing more black medical students than any other school in America. Slaves helped build the White House. Now a black man is president. Triumph over setback forging ahead despite heartbreak and disappointment, being undefeated, that is our story. We're back here with President Obama. We want to get to as many student questions as we can. Nandi Smith has a question. Nandi? Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. President. Thank you, Nandi. I'm a passionate student organizer here at North Carolina a and and I was moved by the traumatic police killing of Michael Brown. And understanding that, um, I wanted to know um, what, 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 I, what advice would you have in developing future activists and leaders in local communities like Greensboro that surround HBCUs? Well, first of all, uh, I, I couldn't be proud of you. As you know, I got started working at the grassroots as an organizer, and it's hard work, and it's frustrating work sometimes, and you feel like you're not making a difference, and then suddenly uh, you know, the, the accumulated effort of all these people all across the country start changing people's hearts and minds and, and transform the country. That's the history of uh, how uh, America was built. Um, so I'm proud of you for that. You know, I think that uh, change happens 
typically not because somebody on high decides that it's going to happen, but rather because at a grassroots level enough people come together that they force the system to change. So uh, you know, we've been grappling with this issue of, of uh, police community relations and uh, the shootings uh, that have taken place in Ferguson, and, uh, the, the, the uh, choking in New York, uh, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, uh, and and what we did was we pulled together a uh, task force for 21st century policing, uh, where we had some of the organizers like you uh, from cities sitting right next to police chiefs and rank and file next to academics and professors to, to figure out are there ways for us to bridge the divide and actually come up with solutions so that communities of color trust police officers poli so police officers can actually do a better job and be safer because they've got the support of communities. And they put together a report that, that starts outlining some very concrete steps that can be taken. Um, and one of the things that uh, I recommend when I meet with young activists is to find out what are the specific things that are going to have an impact on the issue that you care about so that when you uh, finish a protest and you've gotten people's attention, you're now able to say, and by the way, here's what we want you to do. As opposed to, we feel good because we protested, but then eventually the protest dissipates and nothing changes. We go changes. beyond awareness. It, it, awareness is important at the outset, but if you look at the civil rights movement, you know, Dr. King or John Lewis or Rosa Parks, uh, they would begin with the protest, but then very rapidly engage in the powers that be to say, we will stop protesting when you do this specific thing. And with respect, to, so to use then the example of if you're organizing around uh, issues of uh, police shootings, then if you look at this task force recommendation, making sure that they're independent investigations uh, so that people feel transparency and trust. Because folks understand police have a hard job, but they also want to make sure that if there is a shooting that calls to question uh, whether it was uh, fair, just, and right, that it's not being swept under the rug, but it's actually being dealt with in, in an honest, uh, straightforward fashion. Making sure that uh, the training and hiring of police officers is done in a way that uh, encourages the de-escalation uh, of confrontation that eliminates hidden biases that exist in all of us, including, by the way, black police officers, um, that uh, make sure that the police thinks of itself genuinely in terms of protecting and serving rather than keeping a lid on things. Um, so, so I think the specific suggestion I have is, is to take a look at these recommendations of the task force report. What we've been working to do is to try to get cities, counties, sheriff's offices to adopt many of these recommendations, but ultimately we don't have jurisdiction over 18,000 different sheriff's offices and police departments. Local people are the ones who have the power to influence those. I can send the Justice Department in, in the aftermath of something happening. That's what happened in Ferguson. Uh, now in Tulsa, the mayor of Tulsa, I, uh, uh, I think a, a, a good and decent man invited uh, the Justice Department to come in and conduct an independent investigation uh, after the shooting of that uh, individual uh, walking uh, on the highway. But uh, ultimately, 
what really is going to matter is the changes that are done on the grassroots, but you have to know ahead of time what uh, changes you want to bring about. That will make uh, your activism that much more effective. Right. We certainly covered a lot of ground here. Uh, wh what's next for you when you leave office? I'm going to uh, sleep for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take Michelle on a really nice vacation. Okay. Because she deserves it. No, she's been putting up with me for quite some time. Um, and then uh, we're going to continue to work on the issues that we care deeply about. Uh, most prominently, we're going to be interested in figuring out how we can develop the next generation of leaders. So we're going to be spending a lot of time with things like My Brother's Keeper, Let Girls Learn, uh, trying to create a platform where young activists like Nandi uh, and others can get trained and learn from each other uh, and be supported because at the end of the day when you look at American history when you look at human history um, it's it's young people like you that drive change and progress you know uh, in, in to paraphrase Robert Kennedy um, you ask not why but why not why why shouldn't we have a more just society why shouldn't we be able to have opportunity for every child. Why shouldn't we uh, you know, be able to uh, make sure that our, our criminal justice system works uh, for everybody? And, and so Michelle and I, I think if, if we look back 20 years from now and can say that we helped to contribute to uh, the leadership of the next generation to replace us and to exceed what we've accomplished, uh, we'll feel pretty good about ourselves. I think we have a lot of those leaders in here with us tonight here at North Carolina A&T. Uh, we'd like to thank the Chancellor, Dr. Harold O. Martin, for having us here on campus. Dr. Martin, we, we appreciate the hospitality. Thank you, Chancellor. And thank you, Mr. President. We appreciate you being here. I, I might time. also just uh, take your job as Sports Center. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could do a pretty good job. <laughs> You, you have to bump Neil out, out, out of his chair, and he's going to be disappointed about that. Wow. Well, I kind of <laughs> like Neil. He's got a Hawaii connection. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, man. All right. Great Appreciate having you here. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you.